It's the first Juice Summit. I've got to do a keynote. So what, what should I do? Um, I didn't want to just come up here and do a predictable old history of Juice or what's new in Juice 4 sort of talk and tell you about features and things. The whole conference is around Juice. There's workshops and lots of other places where you can get that information. So I wanted to do something that's a bit more, a bit more general, a bit more entertaining, a bit more, of a, a bit more left field. Um, so my, my programming career has been going pretty well so far. Um, I get to write a lot of code. Um, a lot of people use that code. It's all public. Lots of people look at it. Lots of people criticize it. Lots of people say nice things about it. The most common compliment that I get about it is that people love the readability. They say it's really readable. It's very uh, concise and well-written. And that's really satisfying to hear that, because that's exactly what I've always been really striving for. Now, from my point of view, when I'm writing code, I don't, it doesn't seem like I'm ever doing anything particularly clever or difficult. I just seem to be paying more attention to detail and spending maybe putting a bit more into the craft side of it than a lot of other people do. Um, and when I look at other people's code, it does kind of generally look a bit ugly. So I guess you know, there's, something, there's something in that. But, so I thought I'd use the keynote to explore the things that I tend to obsess over, which seems to be working out pretty well for me, and hopefully um, will be inspiring for other people to try and take more of this, the mindset that I've approached coding with in their own work. Programmers, we're, we're pretty straightforward. Try and think of what I can do for you guys that you're going to enjoy. So we've got a room full of programmers. You, we all love showing off. We all love criticizing other people's code. That's the best fun in the world. We love doing stupid stunt things that are difficult, but actually kind of pointless. Um, we love arguing over stats. We love saying, oh, this is faster, this is slower. This is... And we love a bit of recursion. We love, we love things that are kind of meta and look at themselves in recursive ways, because that's just the kind of smart asses we are. We also love learning facts. Coffee will come afterwards. So this is kind of my, my hit list of things I want to, want to, to do in, in this talk. So um, something we've had fun doing at Rowley is the code makeover. And this is a great little exercise where someone volunteers up a mediocre piece of code they've written. And we sit in a room, and the code is we publicly shame that code. And we try to sort of aggressively go around and improve it, rewrite, restructure, just fix everything from like the, the lowest level bits and bits of obvious bracketing in the wrong place, you know, white space problems, right up to like, actually, does this need to be a completely different architecture? And it's a bit like watching those TV shows where a group of like, people in protective suits goes into the house of an obsessive hoarder and starts uh, clearing out bags of rubbish and trying to turn it into something nice. It's, so it's, kind of, it's, it's quite compelling. It's in a kind of car crash way watching this. And we, we've had some fun doing this. So I thought what I'd do today is do one of these sessions and refactor some code. Um, so what should we refactor? <laughs> I, I, I started doing this um, about a week ago um, and when I had the idea for doing this talk. So I thought, well, I'll pick something easy. Because um, my, my aim was to come out with, at the end of this with actually a ref something that was refactored where I could talk through the process involved and show you, hey, you know, this is the result. So I, I chose to do this. Um, I know you all know what this is, right? You can all, you can all, you can all read code from that. It might be a bit small. Um, but this is actually probably running on at least a dozen machines in this room right now. Around the world, this will be running on, I don't know how many billion devices. Um, I might have been a bit overambitious in choosing this. But um, what it is, is Zlib. Um, Zlib factoids. This is a 20-year-old um, project. It's C, which is, makes it easy for me to start. That's a good, easy cleanup um, target in itself. It's about 10,000 lines of code. Billions of devices all over the world. This is very important. It probably has no bugs. Normally, when we're refactoring uh, our internal code, you expect to come up with lots of bugs. You'll be you, they'll be left, right, and center all over the place. This was kind of an interesting one to pick because I figured the last bug fix in, the, in its Git repository was two years ago. And that was the last commit. So it has been pretty well tested everywhere. It's perfectly good. The performance is great. It works. It does the job. Fine. There's nothing wrong with what I'm going to refactor. If you do Agile, you've probably got one of these on your wall. Um, and as a business, this is this makes perfect sense. But, and Zlib passes this with flying colors. It's great. It's 
probably got no bugs. It's well tested. It performs really, really well. Um, you know, if, if you're in charge of Zlib HQ, you obviously as a manager, you ship it. It's done. Um, so really only an idiot would bother to try and improve something that already works perfectly well. Thank you very much. So I thought I'd be that idiot. Um, you, you, there are three types of code that you tend to see. There's good code. We all know what good code is. It's enjoyable to read. You read it, it's, it's, it's like reading a poem. It's beautiful. It's well constructed. And it's fast. It does the job and does it well. And it generally doesn't have any bugs. Um, bad code is what your co-workers write, or your students, <laughs> or your students if, you're, if you're a teacher. Uh, it doesn't work, and it's obviously not going to work, because you can just look at it, and without even having to focus on the, on the words, you know it's rubbish. You can see from 10,000 feet, it's rubbish. Um, bad code, straightforward. Ugly code is the, is the middle ground here, and I would put Zlib in the ugly camp, because it works really well. But it's not elegant, and you start digging in there, and it's, it's ugly. It, it, it works, it's, it's great, it you know, does the job. If you want to compress something, that's what you use. But it, it just feels, it feels like it could be better. So what I kind of want to get across in this is when, when you're writing library code in particular, but any code, um, taking more of a pride in actually not just making something that works, but making something that you're proud of that works is, re is a really important um, mindset. So let's, let's go back to the 10,000 foot view. Um, do we really need all that just to compress some, some code, some data? I mean, this is 2015 now. We have C++14. This is C, this is 10,000 lines of C. Surely we can do this better, given our modern tools, given C++14. It doesn't need to be this big, surely. Even worse, this is just the source code. Before you can use this source code, You've got a configure script. You've got to run autoconf. It'll generate some headers from some, somewhere in here. There's something that gets turned into headers. If you want to use this, you have to run, you have to get it, you have to run config, you have to um, then uh, install it probably, you have to um, then build it with make and it'll create a static lib, and then you have to uh, add some paths to your project to include the headers, and then you have to add some lib paths, and you have to change your build so that it includes the lib and blah, blah, blah. Eventually, you get to actually use this code. Um, do we really need to do all that? Um, I needed zlib inside the juice classes. And juice actually contains all of this code. I hid it all away by using some cunning tricks so that you don't actually have to build this as a static lib. It just gets m included. And we just, inside, hidden away in the juice CPP files, we actually just include all of these C files. And I had to hack a few things where there, there were duplicate symbols and stuff. I made it build, and I did this years ago. And it's all been in there, and you've all been using it for years without knowing. It's, it's in there, and that's, that's, that, that solved the problem. But it still felt ugly to me. Every time I was going through the directory structure, seeing like this whole directory of files in there that just like, didn't, it's too much, too much. Um, the big blue blobs are tables of constants. Um, that somewhere else in here is a little bit of code that actually generates those tables. Do they really need to be there? Do we need to like spam the, have all this stuff in our code base? Or, or is it, do, you know, is there, do we even need these two things to be fixed tables? The green areas are comments. And there's a lot of comments in here because there needs to be a lot of comments in here because it's not very easy to see what's going on. In fact, it's very hard to see what's going on. And you have to read the comments and it, that's, it's, it's good to comment, but if it's better to write code that doesn't need it. Um, visible from space are these two red areas. These are 800 line functions. Um, <laughs> this, 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 they're, both, they're both switch statements, one switch statement, which is used as a state machine with some go-tos at the end. <laughs> Almost every case statement in the switch statement has fall-throughs, so the order is OK, you know, every time I've tried to run um, code quality checking software on the Juice code base, it flags this stuff up. <laughs> so there's some pretty obvious high-level stuff we can do. There's, there's low-hanging fruit. Um, a lot of the nastiness will go away just by choosing idiomatic C++ 11 over C. Um, some of the other nastiness is going to require a bit, more, a bit more intuition, a bit more craftiness to fix it. So I also promised that this talk would have some sort of recursive 
meta aspect to it. Um, so, and some measurements. So this is where they come in. When I, wh when I was thinking about what, def what defines good code, um, I figured, well, good code is as short as it can be without being any shorter. It kind of doesn't compress well. If you write a, a really good piece of code, it, there's not, we all know that the DR, good old DIY principles, we don't repeat ourselves, so there's not a lot of um, repetition in there. There's not a lot of, the, the entropy is high, basically. And by compressing some code, you can measure how high its entropy is. So I figured it'd be kind of fun to use the code I'm writing to compress the code I'm writing and then see how big the result is so that we can see how much it compresses. Um, whether that's a, this is not science. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is just me making some, making some stuff up. Um, I was, the, my, my plan was to look at um, the compressed size and the uncompressed size of the, of the code and just see what, see what the difference is. So I wrote a test program to start with. So I had some unit tests for this and some benchmarking. And um, since I was re refactoring the code that was already inside Juice, this was great because I could do these on two branches and I had a drop-in replacement. So I could just run the same code before, before and after, run the same benchmarks before and after. So this, this was my, um, this is the code size originally. It was 300K after you take the white space out. <coughs> that compresses down to about 100K. So there's about 100K of information in the original. Um, I also, the benchmarks mean, are meaningless at the moment, but that's, that was the original performance. I was really hoping I wouldn't, and I, I was, what I really like at the end of the talk is to say, hey, look how much faster the mine is, but at, at least it shouldn't be any slower. So let's get refactoring. Let's look at the, start with the high level stuff. Um, that's the original folder. This is what I wanted at the end. Um, the first, the easiest thing we can do, the best way to actually get this code into a program is headers only. Uh, there's no reason for it to be anything else. You don't need to link this as a static lib. It's, I mean, I ended up with uh, 3,300 lines of code. It's pretty trivial. It's smaller than the st string header. Um, there's no need for any CPPs, no need for autoconf. Um, this, this header can actually probably be split into two or three files because in there there were, there's compression and decompression classes, but there, I also found there were some um, psychic redundancy check classes which were kind of a standalone thing. So you could pop those out into two other files. It's all the same really, it's personal preference. So after dumping all the original code into, a, into one file, um, I, I waded in there and started hacking away to try and sort of make some, clear some space in the undergrowth and see what's going on. First of all, um, I stripped out all of these wonderful type defs. We had, um, what do we have here? We had three different uh, definitions of long. So we had u long, we had u long f, which is a far u long. What's a far long? I don't know. <laughs> so then we, had, then we had somewhere else, we, we then defined that with a macro as uh, z underscore u long f. Uh, we have an ush, which obviously is a short. We have um, uh, an ushuf. We have an uch, which is an unsigned char, obviously. Um, then we have some, oh, it, these we use all, interchangeably all through the code base. So first of all, delete and some nice standard uh, C++11 types, which we know are going to be the right size. And that, that's lovely copy and paste time doing that. Um, I'm, I've ne also never been a fan of writing type defs with a P on the end for a pointer. That's a very Microsoft thing to do. What I, in, in the code, I managed to actually get rid of most of the pointers anyway and turn them into references, but um, it, it always feels to me like if you're going to have a pointer, put the star there, make it obviously a pointer. So you can see, you, you, you can kind of use it as a star, as in, yeah, do you really want a pointer? Is there a better way of doing this? So it's nice, I think, not hide it behind a, a type def. <coughs> So if you want an example of how modern compilers and standards have made our lives easier, um, there's some definitions in that old, old code that are quite poignant. Um, you can almost see the tear stains on some of these. We've got, um, we've got an Amiga definition down there. Apparently on the VAX, if you want to use fopen, you have to write some assembly language. There's Atari stuff. This, is, this, bit, here is, this bit here is for platforms that don't have memcopy. So it's kind of like looking at um, cave paintings of saber-toothed tigers, this stuff. So anyway. Some of those tears are mine. <laughs> so it was nice to 
put that stuff out of its misery. Um, and this, the, already the code's shooting down, shooting down. Before, we had, oh, for some reason, we had um, a whole allocation system with macros and things called zalloc and zfree. Um, it, this let you add your own allocator to the library because obviously when you're allocating a few K of memory, you need, uh, you need to supply your own allocator for that. Um, the, the algorithm actually, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't need much, much space. Uh, I could probably have made the whole thing just run on the stack with absolutely no allocation. In the end, I, I, kept, I kept it using some heap, heap allocation, but obviously I did that with um, RAII and some uh, juice heap bot classes, um, which actually ended up being in about three different places. It was really, there's really not a lot of allocation needed in this, in this code. Um, next fun thing was to take all of these um, randomly styled def definitions of, um, well, constants and state flags and things and turn them into modern C++11 enum classes, which was really nice to forcibly go through, make that, that, the compiler then makes you go through the code and makes you clear up all of the uses of this. Because everywhere in the code, it was ints were being used as um, every kind of possible flag and meaning. So actually using enum class means you're forced to name everything properly. So all the types become much more readable. The, it's the kind of ripple effect through the code that improves the overall um, structure. The, um, also, I managed to move most of these out of the uh, global namespace and into private, hidden away sections of, of classes. So in fact, even though you're, this is headers only and the whole thing gets pulled in, none of this is going to be, there's uh, maybe 10 different definitions that actually need to be public. The rest of this just gets hidden away and is inaccessible to the users. There's actually, it turned out after digging through it for hours, there's really only three um, structures in there. And given that it's a pretty simple data model, they've managed to do it in a very convoluted way. So we, had, we have a Z stream, which is used for input and output. And we have an inflate state and a deflate state, which is defined obviously in a different way to that one. But, and then the Z stream has a pointer to a, to a, a, def, an in, a deflate state but it sometimes casts that to an inflate state pointer and uses that. And then that has a pointer back. These have a pointer back to the thing that they're in. And none of this is needed. So that all went. And I ended up with just two uh, public functions, which is all you actually need to see, a decompressor and a compressor. They'll have a few, they have a few public functions um, with enum types of status codes. Um, and then big private sections where all of the, the stuff you don't care about happens. Um, naming is probably the most important thing in programming. Um, if you've got good names, then your program kind of writes itself. Um, they're descriptive, good names. They're abbreviated. They're not abbreviated. Um, these are some. There were many, many name changes that improved this code. This is some examples. So, rather than saying uh, unsigned char far star next and then labeling it with a comment, next input. Just call it next input. Um, hold is apparently a bit buffer. I d even without knowing what a bit buffer does or what it's for, obviously you call it a bit buffer. Um, unsigned copy, I mean, what, what is that? Is that a, no a noun or a verb? It, I, you dig in a bit, you read the comments, you see where it's used, oh, it's a number of bytes to copy. Okay, okay, this, I mean, it, you know, it's obvious stuff. Um, and in your own code, when you're, you know, you'll be writing something and maybe on the first pass you throw in a few, a few quick names, but it's always good to go back and say, when someone else who doesn't know what's going on reads this, what are they going to think? And imagine that person is aggressive and they're going to shout at you. So, <laughs> so go back and rename. Um, also, um, I, the, the little constantness I could add, and um, being C, it's always really nice when you take some C code and you, and you see all that big block of variables at the top of a function, you go, no, 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 and just move them down, reduce the scope. You should, if you're a really good programmer, you've been doing this for years, you'll get a little inner sigh of satisfaction when you reduce the scope of something, whether that's making it private or whether it's just moving the scope down, putting, putting a variable away. It's just like putting things out of harm's way. It should, if it doesn't give you a, a good feeling, then you're not, you're not trying hard enough. So there's two types of CRC redundancy checking going on. 
Um, there's uh, CRC32 and Adler32. I don't really understand what either of these things do, but I unpicked it and I rewrote the code. So it doesn't matter what the details are. I'll come back to this one in a minute. But that was the original um, CRC, and that was my rewritten CRC. Uh, oh, no, maybe this, no, this is Adler. This is Adler. Um, I'll show you CNC in a second. But it's really, it's always very not satisfying when you take something that's rambling and sprawling like that and you go down to something that fits on the screen. Um, this one's the CRC. Um, this is the one with the, big, with the big constant table in there. What I've done here, although it's a bit blurry, you can't really see this, um, might be on the next slide. The CRC table, I, 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 wrote the, I tried a little bit of code that generates it. It actually takes like a few microseconds to generate that code. So delete and um, very, very, very nice sort of um, C++ thing we can do here is to have an inline class actually inside the function. Um, next on the next slide. Um, with a, um, with a, a static down at the bottom here, a static initializer for it. So it's, um, it's only ever going to be initialized once. It's going to take a few microseconds uh, when, you're, when your program starts up. But the entire the whole thing is hidden away inside this process function. And that's the only place this is needed. So all completely scoped away out of sight. Um, there are other, um, other bits of um, constant data in the, in the uh, scatter around the library, which it, you hit this kind of, with very big ones, it's obviously going to be better if you can replace it with code. But there's a sliding scale. And so if, the smaller they are, the less likely it is to be useful. I'll leave as an exercise to the user um, whether you how you could replace that with either a const extra or some template metaprogramming to actually eliminate it altogether. But actually, in this case, I, would, I wouldn't do that because I think the compile time overhead, especially for a, for a headers only library, for the compiler actually generating this, um, and the extra binary size probably outweighs the, the advantages of having a table. Um, whereas this is going to be a tiny bit of code, tiny runtime overhead, and it's going to work, brain, work perfectly well. OK, macros must die. And I, was, um, <laughs> I, was, I did eventually remove all the macros from this code, which made me feel good. But it was a bit of a struggle in places. Some, some, some things were easy. So like, there was all this stuff with um, error messages that I could nicely replace with a nice function that just translates those. Um, nice uh, enum classes here. Uh, rather than all these error return, error message uh, macros that were doing things with local variables all the way through the, through the code. Um, one of the things that macros do, which makes them very tempting and very useful, but also very dangerous, are that they can they can mutate local variables. So this is an example that before of um, a very this is part of a part of a, uh, the CRC where it um, it's using using a macro here to, to unroll uh, unroll the loop 32 times, um, and to and this do loop 32 macro works on local variables. It works on both local variables and um, member variables. So that's something that's very hard to replace with a function, um, but um, Luckily, um, we have lambdas for that kind of thing. And I didn't use in this one, but this, this is the after for that, where um, rather than having a macro that works on the local variables, I just rolled the local variables up into a little inline function class inside the function, and then gave that some methods. Um, and then called the methods, and that did the same job. Now, my code here actually looks bigger than the original. That was the original. That's mine. But that's because the original, this is only half the original, because the original, this is CRC little. They had an equally big CRC big, which is big Endian, uh, where they would copy and pasted the little one, changed a few lines of code, and that was a big Endian version. So I managed to compress those two, boil that all down together. So this is my entire function. And all the little big Endian bits, the differences are here in these two lines. So you can easily see above each other what the differences are, rather than having two completely rambly functions that were very slightly different. <clears throat> so this is a related class. This is the Adler CRC. Um, in this one, um, the, um, this is a very performance critical loop. And um, again, this is using loop unrolling. And this is quite interesting, because um, when I wrote it, I wrote these processing methods, and I put inline. 
Now, if you go to any compiler talk, if you go to a big conference about C++, the compiler guys are going to get up on stage and they're going to go, the compiler knows better than you. You don't have to say inline. The compiler will make a far better judgment of whether something should be inline than you ever will in your whole life. Well, in this case, it didn't. Because um, when, I, when, I, when I wrote this, it, my performance went, pff, fell off a cliff. Um, and, and so I actually used this forced inline macro, which is actually a juice um, macro that maps to whatever compiler-specific um, attribute you use to actually force a function to be inlined. When I put that back, everything was back to normal. But it wasn't inlining this stuff. Um, but when you, make, when you force it to do its job properly, the, the performance is just as good as it was with, with the old original macros just doing this stuff inline. These were more challenging to replace. Um, these, were, these macros here were used inside that 800-line switch statement. Um, note the go-to down there. Um, these were particularly nasty because they mutate both local variables in the function they're being used in by name and uh, variables in, in, the, in the class as well. So for these, I had to resort to lambdas, which actually worked out to be very, a very elegant way of doing it. So these would go, rather than having global macros with, 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 name, with names like load that will never conflict. You'll ne no one else is going to use a macro called restore, are they, ever? That'll, there's no danger of that being a problem. So, um, so rather than that, we keep all the scope local and these uh, had some little lambda functions inside, this, inside the function that was using them. And um, this is actually all the stuff on the previous slide and some more. And, um, and by capturing by reference the local variables, and uh, then using, uh, and then also using um, member variables, we could do all the stuff that these these guys were doing, but without having to resort to nasty C. Uh, to get rid of the go to, I ended up using an exception, um, which annoys me in, immensely. So instead of they were using go to to get to the end of this big um, state machine, and I couldn't find another way from inside a lambda to sort of just jump out of many levels of scoped um, indirection. So I ended up with a macro, which is a tiny performance hit. And um, I've, if, I, if I had more time, I think I could probably come up with a better way of doing that whole state machine that would avoid that altogether. So um, yeah, maybe, maybe as a hangover task one day, I'll, I'll fix that. Um, a lot of what I've done so far has just been fine-grained tweaking. Um, but the most important thing when you're re reviewing real code is spotting the hidden patterns in there, which could be more clearly represented by the program itself. Uh, so for example, something I noticed was um, that they, were, they had a bunch of scattered functions and variables and macros that seemed to be collectively managing a FIFO of bits. So when you spot this kind of thing, it's always important to try and pull it all together. And, um, I end up uh, pulling, so this is an example of where I pulled all of, them, all of their bit, their FIFO, bit FIFO functionality together into one class, called it output FIFO, which is what it did, added some useful member variables. And this, when you do this, it also, it, it labels, it, it makes it clear to, to you as the user, that, as, the, as, the, as the coder, that this, this is a concept. So when you start spotting ways that this is used, around the code base, you can start to see other patterns. So I noticed that all over the, um, all over the code base, they, were, they, were, they, were, they had explicit um, bits of code like this, where they would write an integer as four bytes by sh bit shifting. And they do this all over the place. So I replaced that with um, a function like write int msb, which made all, all of the rest of the code get much cleaner. <clears throat> um, there was also code where they were writing sequences of bytes. So um, over here, they write the same, do the same thing multiple times. So in order to be able to write an equivalent which is like this, where we just have one line that takes a whole sequence, um, uh, I used some C++ uh, 14, 11, 14, goodness, with a variadic template that can take any number of arguments. So writing this once makes the rest of the code much cleaner. So in a kind of recursive way, to be meta, this, this kind of exercise of looking for patterns in the code and then replacing those patterns with one instance which you reuse with a single copy of whatever it is, whether, whether that's 
an operation, a bunch of things you do at the same time. It's kind of, it's kind of the same thing that GZIP itself is doing, because um, that's looking for patterns and replacing them with a token. We're doing the same. And if you keep compressing and comp compressing, the entropy is going to go up. Um, as well as collecting together behavior into nicely named functions, you can um, also collect together um, variables into nicely related classes. So um, they, they had a structure here which defined some parameters of compression. So, um, so some, I don't know what half of these things do. There's, they're, they're the kind of parameters that they use when they're looking for, for, for blockchains. And um, they, but they weren't really using this. All of the, once they got this configuration structure and all the, all the values in it were just being passed around as integers separately all over the code base. So I made a point of going through and taking my version, but I would always pass this as a by value type. So that group of, of uh, variables moved around together. So if we, if we had some settings in one of the classes that, about the compression type, it wasn't just a bunch of integers copied from here. It was one of these. If you wanted to set it, you set it. If you want to return it, you return the whole thing. And the overhead is nothing for this. And it really helps manage the complexity of what you're working on. And it's, <coughs> it, it's uh, doing that kind of thing is a counter for the sort of bit rot you get when people start adding to an existing project, especially when you get um, big projects with lots of people working on it, like this probably was. Um, so when people don't feel confident changing the code, they tend to make very small changes. So someone might add an integer because they need it to do what they're doing. But they very rarely go back and actually refactor the whole thing because there's now too many integers. They very rarely go and wrap those up into a structure. So you, that, it's a kind of bit rot. And occasionally, you need, to, you need to be harsh on yourself when you're writing stuff, but also when you're reviewing to say, actually, you know, come on, can we structure this better? Can we pack things together into, into blocks that make more sense and have more of a concept around them? There's a Boy Scout motto that you should always leave a place tidier than when you arrived, even if that means picking up someone else's litter. So I spent a couple of days frantically fighting all this stuff. Um, so was it worth all that strain on my tendons? Um, this, is, this is the 10,000 foot view of the end result. That's the original. And this is kind of my 3,000 line version. Still a couple of little constants. Probably leave them in. Um, I don't think it'd be much, very helpful to remove those. <coughs> This is the code size. Um, so this is the com as before. This is the com this is the uh, the code with the white space removed, and the same thing compressed. And this is my code with the white space removed, and that's my code compressed. Um, I'm very happy with the size. Interestingly, the entropy. I was hoping to say, ah, oh, mine doesn't compress very well at all, whereas the original, uh, you know, it compresses because there's so much redundancy in there. Actually, the reverse was true. And I think that's because the original had all this constant data in there. But also because, actually, mine has longer variable names. And um, it's, it's a bit more regular. So I don't know. I was disappointed about that, but very happy with the, with the, the code size at the end. I, 3,300 lines. It could probably go down to 2,500, I'm guessing, with a bit more, a bit more TLC. Um, the performance, I was really hoping to go, and mine is twice as fast. It's exactly the same, which, which, which is a win, which is a win, because um, uh, it, doesn't use, it, it, it doesn't use a lot of the tricks that the original one was using to get performance. So I was just really relieved. Actually, you could bias these. You, by, by changing the benchmark, you could probably bias. I could have cheated. I could have changed the bench, benchmark in a way that makes mine look a little bit better. But it, it depends entirely what you feed the thing with. But just to reiterate, don't write to me about this. This is not science. This is made up rubbish. It's not, these are not official stats, meaningless. Um, so are there any, is there any point for a user in what I've done? Um, there's a few. I mean, it's headers only, being headers only is really useful um, because it makes it so much easier to use this kind of stuff. Um, being much smaller will probably reduce bloat in somebody's application. Um, the actual API becomes better just by having stronger types. And if I really was going to press on with this, which I might do, um, then refactoring it into a different API, because I was just copying the original API. I wasn't trying to change that. Um, you, could, you could actually make it much more modern. You could use streams. That kind of change would ripple through the whole, the whole code base and probably simplify things more internally. Um, 
what point am I trying to make? Um, probably just bravado. I, I don't know. It's a few random thoughts. Better code is better for its own sake, surely. Um, you know, given a bit more time, what, what I ended up with could end up being a really slick implementation of the algorithm. Um, and eventually, I'd like to pop it into Juice as a replacement for Zlib, um, even though nobody would know the difference. But I'd, I'd kind of know. I'd know it was in there. I'd feel, feel slightly, slightly happier at night. Um, but if there's really any point I'm trying to make, it's we should, be, we should all be on the lookout for anything that could be improved. Um, even if you don't understand what it is you're looking at. I mean, I, didn't, I don't know really how this compression algorithm works, but I could still make it much easier for other people to come along and try to understand what it does. Uh, something else that I thought was important while I was doing it is, like, this is actually a really good exercise if you're a beginner. Um, I, I would really recommend doing, get this code or pick some easier bit of code and just refactor it. Just go through, look at, read books on good um, C++ style and modern technique. And just take something that's obviously a bit rubbish and just go through and see what you can do with it. Because actually doing that is really good practice and it gets you into the habit of thinking, oh, I'm not satisfied with this. Come on. You know, you'll, do, you'll, do, you'll do a pass, you'll improve something, and then look, step back again and go, OK, what else can I do? And once you're in the habit of thinking that, you'll think that while you're writing new code and your code will be better first time around. Um, obviously, after this, I'm going to get people saying, whoa, can we look at the finished code? Um, and yeah, I was going to post a, a GitHub URL or something, but then I thought, well, hang on, what, what copyright do I put at the top? Because um, the original is under a, a permissive license. But um, it's like if you take a car and you replace the wheels and then you replace the bodywork and then the engine and then the seats, at what point is it not the original car? So. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll keep bashing away at it until there's really nothing of the original left. Because the one, the one thing I really I didn't quite get time to get rid of was the damn state machines. So I think that could be really nicely well, uh, rewritten using lambdas and cascading lambdas that return lambdas. And you could do a lovely state machine design with that. So I might do that. And then when it's definitely all my code, I'll probably put it into juice or, or, make it, uh, or make it public. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. Going is to explain this? to a noob how one practically goes about refactoring code, what the workflow is like, what would you say? I would say um, change small things incrementally. You you sit down, you look at, you look through it, you find something that's obviously wrong, you fix it, you try, you make sure the stuff still works. You find another thing. You can do this incrementally, and as you're doing it, you'll start with the, the obvious things, and then as you're as you're reading the code, you'll get a better picture for what it does, and then you'll start to see, you'll start to think, actually, I see what it does now, but maybe it could have been done better architecturally in a different way. So the bigger, the bigger changes come later. Just get in there and pick the obvious stuff. You know, fix the, fix the layout. Replace tabs with spaces. Do the, you know, replace some names that don't look very obvious. If you look at a name and go, well, what does that do? Replace it. Figure out what it does, replace it. And then you'll find that you just come, if you just sit there, you'll come up with more and more things to do. So, uh, for example, on replacing names, find and replace, or manually reading through the code, finding every instance of um, it, understanding it, rewriting I, it by I hand? Would be, I think you'd be brave to do a global find and replace on the name. <laughs> I mean, unless it's a really unusual name. Just, we've got here the question, so if you, if you would allow uh, people at the back with the microphone to, to ask the question. Yep. So, after you did the changes, did it work first time? Um, I had a couple of places along the way where I broke it, but because I was running my benchmark unit test out all the time, mm -hmm. I spotted that. So you, you need unit tests if you're going to be Because that's the danger of making these big changes, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Obviously, I mean, obviously, only an yeah. idiot would do this because the only thing I could possibly do to this code is break it because it already worked perfectly well. That's why this is a pointless stunt. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that you'd like to eventually have all of your own code in there. What do you make of a comparison between 
refactoring a complicated thing like Zlib and actually just starting fresh and writing it from scratch? If you know how the algorithm itself works, then yes, yeah, start from scratch and rewrite it. That, write it. Write it yourself, that's probably a better way. But I don't know how Zlib works. I still don't understand properly how it works. But I, can, I know I can keep iterating on this until it becomes something really nice. And probably by that point, I will understand what, how it works and then it'll be too late. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. I was just wondering if you can comment on um, sort of the proactive approach, which is where you're going to write this thing from the start, but, but to move on from that question, and, and how much you design before writing and how, you know, where you find the balance between putting all your effort into the design such that the code writing is essentially the easy bit, or, you know, where's the balance and the trade-off in that? Um, my, my, in, in my humble experience over the years, um, you never get, even if you sit with a piece of paper and a whiteboard for weeks, you'll never get it right first time. Um, whatever you come up with, you're going to end up refactoring. So quite often it's best to just do it, do a minimal viable product that works. Um, you know, don't, don't use tabs, don't do anything really obviously silly, but um, you can always come back and, and refactor. And you should be coming back and looking at what you've done anyway. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I look back at stuff I wrote a couple of years ago and find that embarrassing. So if you ever get to the point where you're looking back on code you've written and not seeing mistakes in it, you should be worried. Because that means that, well, I don't know, you're either, you're either on the way down in your career or, um, <laughs> or, or you're so good that your code's utterly unimprovable and at which point you should you just, yeah. I don't know what happens when that happens. <laughs> Okay, well, one last question here. Uh, what would you say would be the criteria for writing stuff as headers only? Um, for headers only, um, the criteria, well, I mean, it's got to be concise enough for that, you know, it's not too much for people to include. But you, in terms of what you should pay, out, pay attention to, make sure you keep things as, as much private as possible. Don't, don't um, put too much public too many public definitions in there. Make sure that the attack space for a user who's using this is as, as small as possible. Um, because it's very easy in the headers only, if you think headers only, and your implementation is right there next to the definitions, it's very easy to have things in there that you need, which you accidentally make public, but they really shouldn't because you only ever use it internally. So, so be very aware of scoping and private, and keeping things private where you can. Thank you.